He was blind and Ananias was sent to him uh, because Ananias was set, uh, he was instructed by the Lord to bring about God's healing grace to him so that he could recover his sight. So he was, he has already accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But in Acts chapter 22 verse 16, it does clearly state that that is not enough. Because in Acts chapter 22 verse 16, Ananias told him, Now, why delay? Get up and have yourself baptized. And your sins washed away. Calling upon his name. So it's very clear that while Paul, whose name was, or was Saul, whose name was changed to Paul, accepted Jesus Christ right there and then when he had his, he, his actual experience with the presence of Christ and he spoke to him from heaven. Ananias was sent for, for Ananias also to baptize him because baptism is necessary so that he can complete his being reincorporated into the body of Christ. So that's what that's why we say it is necessary for salvation. In Acts chapter 2, verse 37 to 38, again, going back to the account of the Pentecost, you know, 3,000 were converted by the preaching of uh, Peter that day when he received the Holy Spirit. He was so quiet that he started preaching so effectively. 3,000 were converted, right? Did it end there? No. Now when they heard this, this referring now to the 3,000, they were cut to the heart and they asked Peter and the other apostles, We believe you. What are we to do now, my brothers? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized. It's necessary that you be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Because your sins will not be forgiven if you are not baptized. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Period. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 persons were added back then. So they believed Peter. They said, what are we going to do now? And Peter said, okay, you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's not enough. Now you need to be baptized because that is necessary. So, I know that the next question would be, you mean to say anybody who is not baptized cannot be saved? Because there is other way by which your baptism can be received. We have what we call baptism of blood. What is baptism of blood? Paragraph 28 of the Catechism explains what it is. You know, the only saint in the Philippines that's canonized so far is uh, Lorenzo Luis. But there's not, uh, I'm not aware of his uh, uh, story, but um, when he was, when he was, uh, I think, as far as I know, he, he was not baptized when he was martyred. But when he was martyred, when he gave his life for Christ, when he was killed, that he, he was even proclaimed as a saint. Okay. So in paragraph 12, did I think of it? Yes, well, 58. The church has, al has always had the firm conviction that those who suffer death for the sake of the faith, without having received baptism, are baptized by their death for and in Christ. This baptism of blood, like the desire for baptism, brings about the fruits of baptism without being a son. So if you are if you die as a martyr for Christ, then that is equivalent to baptism, and we call it baptism of blood. And there's also the baptism of desire. Because, that, for instance, those who are converting to Catholicism, they go to the RCIA, they're called catechumens, and they're not, they're not baptized yet until after they, they, they finish the process. I think the pra pra process takes how many years? Tom? How many years is the RCIA process? More than a year, right? Oh, I think it's the same money. Anyway, uh, in the RCIA, you have to go to the process. What if they die before they are being baptized? Are they, are, will they not be saved? First, let me read the paragraph 1259. For catechumens who die before their baptism, their experience
this is desire to receive it. That's why they are in the RCA program. They desire to be baptized as Catholic. Their spiritual desire to receive it together with repentance of their sins and charity assures them the salvation that they were not able to receive through the sacrament. What about the Muslims? What about the Jews? What about other the members of other religions? Can they, can they not be saved? What's, what's the official teaching of the church? They too can be saved. We have what we call baptism of desire. Man, let me, let me read paragraph 60. This is teaching the church. Since Christ died for all, it's not just for the Christians, He died for everybody, for the Muslims, for the Jews, and everybody else. And since all men are in fact called to one and the same destiny, which is divine, we must hold that the Holy Spirit offers to all the possibility of being made partakers in a way known to God of the pastoral mysteries. Every man who is, these are the requirements, ignorant of the gospel, they never heard about Christ. They are ignorant of the gospel of Christ and of his church, but seeks the truth and thus the will of God in accordance with his understanding of it can be saved. It may be supposed that such persons would have desired that this explicitly if they had known its necessity. So that is that baptism of desire. You're ignorant of Christ, you've never heard about Christ, probably you heard about Christ, but you're, you're still ignorant of it without, no, without any fault of your own. And you know you have, you have you know the truth the way Christ or God has revealed it to you. And you follow, you know, your heart really in good conscience follows everything that you know that will bring you to God. That is equivalent to an implicit desire to be with Christ. And an implicit desire to be with Christ is an implicit desire to receive the baptism of Christ. See the theology there? Okay. Illustration. The tip of the cross. Remember? At the right side of the cross. the left side of, of Christ, uh, uh, the crucifix. There, there were three of them who were crucified that night. Right? One of them was a thief. And one of them didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ. He was even mocking Jesus, Jesus Christ on the cross. And the other one believed in Jesus Christ. Right? And Jesus Christ made a promise. And then he said, Lord, Jesus, remember me. And you go to paradise, something like that. And Jesus Christ was one of you. This day, you will be with me in paradise. Was he baptized? No. But there was a baptism of desire. There was a baptism of desire. He desired Christ. And by the way, the Catechism also says in paragraph 27 that Christ who instituted the sacrament is not bound by the sacrament because he's the one who instituted the sacrament. And he was the one who gave the, the forgiveness to this person on the tip of the cross because of that desire to be with Christ. So your desire to be with Christ is equivalent <coughs> to your baptism that saves. And because that baptism of desire. See? So anybody can be saved. What? Ah, it doesn't mean, okay, if everybody can be saved, then why do we have to, to uh, evangelize people to Catholicism? Because it's, it's, if you know more about God, it is, then it become, you become more knowledgeable who God is and what His wishes are and what pleases Him, then it would be easier for you to attain yourself rather than not knowing any of this thing. Okay, so they are work they are at the disadvantage of non Catholic brothers and sisters. Okay. So next question. What about the infant? You know when I was baptized I I, I, I raised it up to my pastor I said, Oh I was already baptized when I was an infant. Did you did you appreciate anything when you were an infant? You remember it? I'm sure you don't even remember, even, even remember when you were baptized. Did you? No. I said, no, no that's right. I couldn't, I, I couldn't explain myself because I didn't really study the Catholic faith. Okay. So that's why they attack a lot this uh, infant baptism. Why are you getting baptized when, when you're baptized in this case? Okay, so ask this question. Okay, so we know that this is, this is a disease. You're born with it. 
If you are born with a disease and your mom, uh, who would decide? Who would decide for you to be inoculated from this disease? Huh? Your parents. Right? Same with true baptism. And there are there are passages in scripture that we prove that it was the practice in the early church to baptize infants. There are. And that's what we're that's where we're going now. Acts chapter 16, verse 15. You know, there was this uh, baby named Lydia who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and the whole household was baptized. Acts chapter 16. After she and her household had been baptized, she offered us an invitation. So, everybody in the household was baptized. It's very possible that there were infants in that household. And there's, there's also this, belief, this uh, jailer, you know, uh, in the same chapter book of the book of Acts. He put them in a, uh, all the silos were praying and singing hymns, you remember that? And then the, the, uh, the walls of the jail just broke apart and they were able to escape and the jailer was very much afraid. And uh, all the silos at your team that he will be protected. And he, this is what he asked in verse uh, 30. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you and your household will be saved. And then in the next verse, in verse 32, he said, he and all his family were baptized at once. It's very possible that in this household, people, the infants were being baptized. And the Catechism so summarizes this in paragraph 1252 when it says, The practice 